Hello adventurers, Melron here. Classic WoW is iconic because of its immersive world, mysterious dungeons, intense PvP, and social community. These aspects are what drive so many of us to venture back once again. However, there are many locations in Classic Azeroth that go untraversed, unseen, or even underappreciated. Some of these places are in plain sight, while others require some digging. This series' aim is to illustrate that there is no need to rush your Classic WoW experience and to stop and smell the roses from time to time. Welcome to Classic WoW Gems. Greetings ladies and gentlemen, Melderon here. Welcome to episode 4 of Classic WoW Gems. In this episode we're going to do something a bit different. Usually I serve as your tour guide for physical locations and points of interest in Classic Azeroth. However in this episode we will visit my imaginary art gallery to explore some two dimensional assets found in Classic WoW. We as players spend a lot of time looking at town calculators in attempts to maximize our DPS, PvP prowess, healing or tanking potential. However. Have you ever spent time to look at the magnificent backdrops that lie behind your favorite talents? If you haven't, you're in for a treat. In this episode, I'd like to put these masterful pieces of art on display for you and provide my opinions on how well they embody each spec and class and what they convey to me. There are a total of 27 specs in Classic WoW and there are unique pieces of art for each of them. Let's begin with the protectors of all life and keepers of order, the druids. The Balance Tree art at first glance seems to not do the spec justice. However, upon further inspection, the growing moss and roots on this ancient stone head remind me of the unrelenting consuming power of nature itself. Eventually, all things, no matter how ordered, succumb to nature's grasp and persistence. Balance Druids rely on the eternal struggle between life and death to preserve order in the natural world. They use this power to bring their enemies to heal. And in that light, I believe this work embodies this notion well. The relevance of the Feral Tree art is much clearer. Here we see a Night Elf Druid in their ferocious bear form with the Pale Moon looming above. This is fitting as the Night Elves worship the Moon Goddess Alune. In this piece it feels that she is looking down on her disciple with pride, protecting him or her as they, in turn, protect their allies as well as the wilds below. The moon also is synonymous with shapeshifting, like in werewolves, so there is also some classical fantasy elements at play here. Not only is there a pool of clean, purifying water in the foreground, but also shafts of golden light pouring down from the heavens. Both water and light are related to life and the powers of good. In addition, the greens and browns of the living world take up large spaces in this piece, clearly representing the druid's class fantasy as stewards of nature. You can imagine that this would be a place that a druid would come to commune with the spirits of nature themselves. Now let's move on to the masters of the wild and ranged combat, the hunters. The ferocious cat in the foreground boldly represents the nature of the beast mastery tree. Hunters that learn skills in this tree are more connected with their animal companions, allowing them to commune with their beasts to boost their prowess in the wilds of Azeroth. Aside from the powerful predator ready to strike, there is significant imagery of plant life, which hints at the hunter's connection to the natural world. The marksman tree art is perhaps one of the most direct and overt pieces of all. Marksman hunters spend their time increasing their skills with projectile weapons, bows, and guns. The arrows in flight, falling to earth in search of their targets, are a clear representation of this. As with the Beast Mastery Tree, the greenery below remind us that hunters thrive out in the natural world, far away from the trappings of towns and holdfasts. Survival hunters are masters of the wilderness and pride themselves on their trapping, tracking, and pathfinding skills. Their survival tree art displays an idyllic forested landscape complete with a small waterfall, pouring its contents into a clean blue pool. Also, there is a clear source of dimensionality as light pours into our view from the distance beyond. To me, this illustrates the guiding light that lead these hunters to their next adventure. Now it's time to move on to the disciples of ice, fire, and arcane knowledge, the mages. Arcane mages are on a never-ending quest to learn as much as they can, forever seeking the ancient and perhaps even forbidden knowledge that Azeroth's history can provide. This piece embodies that quest perfectly. The wooden table, illuminated by candlelight, accompanied by leaning towers of dusty tomes, speak to the incessant need for arcane mages to plumb the mysteries of the magical arts. The bones of the ancient beast suspended above and the strange blue light filling the room add a sense of mystery to this piece. 
Fire mages spend their lives learning to harness the raw power of flame. This destructive magic takes amazing levels of strength and mental control to wield. It is unclear if this dark volcano in the distance is Black Rock Mountain itself, but the charred earth, fiery oranges, and deep reds of this piece speaks to the dangerous nature of fire magic and the almost insurmountable level of commitment to become a true master of flame itself. Frost is the harbinger of winter, its grasp putting whatever it touches into an almost reverent stasis. The frozen landscape in this piece delivers not only feelings of a relentless cold, but those of blistering winds and the unforgiving control that winter has on its victims. In that way, this art represents frost mages very well, as they prefer controlling their targets, keeping them in a distance, while they use frost magic to slow them until their eventual demise. Now we move on to the warriors of light and protectors of the innocent, the paladins. The holy talent art is clear and unabashed. Like all of the Paladin art, they seem to be modified screenshots of actual in-game locations. This is clearly the inside of Stormwind Cathedral, a place for adherents of the Holy Light to pray and revere their deity. Holy Paladins are the most pious of their brotherhood, spending their free time praying and empowering their healing abilities. In this image, we see the Holy Altar at the center of the image with what seems to be light emanating from it. You can also imagine a Paladin kneeling and praying at the base of the stairs. For protection paladins, we travel outside the Great Cathedral of Stormwind to admire its medieval architecture. Protection paladins aim to guard their allies and the weak from evil and those that wish to bring them harm. Just as buildings protect us from the elements with stone and metal, protection paladins protect those under their guard with their mighty shields and holy magic. In addition to this, the radiant rising sun in the background, bathing the city in its golden light, reminds us that in addition to keeping us safe, protection paladins still derive their power from the holy light. The Throne Room of Lordaeron, a haunted place still today, was the very location that then Prince Arthas struck down his own father, King Taranis II, before fully giving himself over to the Lich King's control. After this event, mighty Lordaeron fell to the scourge. This is perhaps the perfect location to signify the vengeance that Retribution Paladins seek against their enemies, the Scourge, and Arthas himself. As with the other Paladin tree art, there is always a source of golden light representing the holy light that drives each Paladin to achieve their goals. Now it's time to cover the Masters of Healing and the Benders of Shadow, Priests. Disciplined priests spend their time perfecting their mental state, pondering the mysteries of the light, and purging evil thoughts and acts from their minds and bodies. Because of this, I believe that focusing on architecture is perhaps perfect, as mathematics is commonly seen as the most pure of disciplines. Interestingly, however, this ancient night elven architecture is far from what most would think of when thinking of priests. But it is hard to argue that the masonry of the night elves is perhaps the most precise in the world. In that way, this image does disciplined priest justice. For the Holy Priest Talon art, we are met again with more Night Elven architecture. However, instead of the ancient columns we were given in the Discipline art, here is an image of a Night Elven Lodge type structure bathed in holy light. It is interesting to me that human and dwarven art is not used here, but the sheer beauty of this building, complete with a giant tree and trickling water, makes me think of Rivendell from Lord of the Rings, and Frodo returning to health after his near brush with death with the Nazgul. Perhaps this is the closest thing we have to a hospital in Azeroth, and I can imagine holy priests hard at work here, mending the sick and the weary. The Ruins of the once great capital of Lordaeron, a place of shadows, place of curses. What better locale is there to portray the dark brothers of the priestly order? Shadow priests have abandoned order for chaos and discipline for madness. The aberrant and twisted ruins almost play at odds with the more conservative architectural pieces from holy and discipline, almost mocking them. Even the darkened stormy sky seems to represent the breaking of order with a bolt of lightning parting the sky just as shadow magic parts the mind of the wielder. Let us now move on to the experts of deception and surprise, the rogues. Before analyzing this piece, I'll start by asking you, the viewer, would you walk down this path alone? I know I wouldn't. Assassination rogues pride themselves on their ability to kill quickly and silently. This piece is masterfully done because it not only signifies death and darkness, but also provides physical space for our assassins to hide. There are multiple places where you can almost imagine a rogue lurking, waiting for an unsuspecting passerby just to spring out, slit their throats, and drag them back into the darkness. Also, I wonder where this piece is set, or if it is meant to represent some in-game location. The only location that comes to mind is Deadwind Pass. To be quite frank, this piece is a bit of a stretch for me. The quality of the piece is amazing. The use of light and shadow make you ponder this piece over and over again. However, I struggled to connect it to the martial power of combat rogues. 
These rogues prefer to use swords and maces instead of daggers, and therefore likely train side by side with warriors. Because of this, perhaps the artists want us to imagine these rogues training in some faraway bastion with barbaric warriors. In that light, this piece starts to become more clear. The jagged spikes emanating from the keep's towers and walls deliver a sense of brutality and battle readiness. Subtlety is quiet. Subtlety is shadow. Yet subtlety is rapid. All of these words make me think about the death that these rogues inflict on their victims. This ghostly image perhaps embodies those words as well. As with the assassination art, you can almost imagine rogues hiding among the dark trees below. Also, notice the minimal or subtle use of colors in this image. It is mostly made up of black and white. Perhaps this is how subtlety rogues see the world. In extremes. In life. Or death. Now it's time to move to the Masters of the Elements and the Keepers of the Ancestors. The Shaman. This is perhaps one of the most interesting pieces out of all, considering it's not what we expect. When I think of Elemental Shaman, I think of lightning, fire, and frost. However, what are we given in this piece? An image of the cosmos, the Twisting Nether. Upon first inspection, I was a bit disappointed. However, I believe what the artist is trying to portray here is that Elemental Shaman look to the origins of their power, not just to the fonts of natural magic in the physical realm, the elements. All magical energy bases itself in the cosmos. We are all born of stars, and the matter that drifts through the darkness of space and time. Here is where Elemental Shaman find the true nature of their power. As a Shaman player, part of me still thinks of Elemental when I look at this piece, because at the center is a giant bolt of crackling lightning coming down from the stormy sky. However, there are definitely elements in this portrait that really embody enhancement gameplay. For one, I can imagine a shaman wielding a giant axe being struck by that bolt of lightning and then splitting into three orbs to form their lightning shield. Moreover, the deep canyon of hewn stone roots my imagination into the elemental forces of earth. Again, I can almost imagine chunks of rock floating into the air and orbiting a giant mace or axe to form the rock biter weapon enhancement. This piece is interesting. When I think of Restoration Shaman, I first think of the cleansing power of water, since water totems are mostly restorative in nature. However, this piece has no visible water in it. Instead, we are met with an ancient troll ziggurat in a deep jungle. It is no secret that the trolls are one of the most ancient denizens of Azeroth and likely have vast knowledge of medicinal plants that grow in the forest, as well as spells that can even bring the dead back to life. All in all, this is perhaps a surprising piece, but I think it fits the specialization well. The next class we will visit are the Disciples of Forbidden Knowledge, the Warlocks. The haunted and accursed Agamemnon Mills is perhaps the perfect setting for warlocks that specialize in spreading curses and diseases. The curse of undeath, brought to Lordaeron by the Lich King and his forces, spread through the land like a cancer, leaving nothing but rot and death in its wake. Similarly, affliction warlocks do this to the bodies and the minds of their victims, leaving them shrunken and shriveled husks of their former selves. Although there are no demons in this portrait, we can clearly see the effects fell magic has on living organisms and inanimate objects alike. If you close your eyes, you can almost imagine what this location looked like before fell magic adultered it. This is what happens if demonic powers are left unchecked, and perhaps even serves as a warning for any would-be warlock who wishes to bend demonic power to their will. This work reminds us that demonology warlocks must constantly walk the fine line between control and chaos when summoning their demonic slaves. The fiery meteors falling from the fire-scarred sky are a direct symbol of the power that destruction warlocks wield, fire and brimstone. However, this fire is anything but natural. Instead of a world ablaze, we see a background littered with the bones of giant beasts, perhaps demons themselves, and a foreground of corrupted and barren soil. Destruction warlocks primarily defeat their enemies with the power of fell flame, but this image reminds us that the direct source of their power also brings a creeping death and decay. It's now time to move to our final class the experts of martial combat and weapon mastery, the warriors. Two images? The arms tree was first planned to use a bluish gray image to the left, but was changed to the image on the right at some point during Vanilla WoW's development. Both are similar in the fact that we see swords depicted in the portraits, but that's where the similarities end. The original image seems to be located in the place of ancient reverence, perhaps where kings and heroes of old are buried. We see what is likely a statue holding a two-handed blade in the background, and what maybe is a human being in the foreground. It's hard to tell. However, the creeping roots around the blade tell me that this is also a statue. I think this piece is a bit abstract and that it really doesn't allude to the martial prowess of the arms warrior. However, its overall dark but reverent theme makes me think of a warrior kneeling before battle to receive the blessing of some ancient hero. The image to the right clearly depicts the Lich King's cursed blade, Frostmourne, another befuddling image. 
Clearly this is the weapon of a death knight, but it seems out of place, buried into stone in a hot, arid landscape. The heavens appear to be on the verge of tearing apart due to some horrible power about to break free. This is what I think of when I think of an arms warrior, the potential to unleash heavy amounts of damage to unsuspecting foes. It is difficult to imagine what type of power is encircling the stone peak. Is it emanating from the clouds above, or from a berserking fury warrior cleaving through his foes on the mountain pass? Stone and rock are commonly synonymous with strength and power, and that may be what the artist is attempting to portray here. However, this piece is another enigma to me. I like to imagine that this fiery energy represents the pure, unhindered fury of the warrior class itself, breaking free from its either human or magical bonds. Castle-like keeps, wrought from stone, built into the jagged cliffs themselves, stand in defiance to the water and winds below. In time, erosion will turn every mountain into rubble and every stone into sand. But these towers seem to yell, not today. This image clearly illustrates the role of protection warriors well as stalwart and brave defenders who instead of waiting for the perfect time to strike, rush into battle, head and shield first. Just as these towers provide shelter from the elements to those who would take up residence within, protection warriors and their mighty shields guard their allies from the onslaught of powerful foes. Well, we've made it through all 27 of the specs. I really enjoy describing to you how these images make me think about each class and each specialization. I think for the most part, the artists or artists did an amazing job condensing the flavor of each spec into these portraits. However, this is of course an opinion piece. I want to hear your opinions as well. Which one was your favorite? Do you think that your favorite class and specs are represented adequately in these portraits? Let me know in the comments section below. These works of art provide another example why you should stop and smell the roses sometimes in Classic WoW. Keep on keybinding and grinding everyone. I hope to see you all in Classic Azeroth. Thanks for watching everyone, stay tuned for the next Classic WoW Gems. In the meantime, don't forget to leave a like and a comment on this video, and be on the lookout for new Death Camp Melderon TV content by subscribing, and thank you patrons for making videos like this one possible. Keep on key bonding and grinding baby, I hope to see you in Classic Azeroth. Greetings adventurers, Melderon here. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you'd like to sport some official Def Camp Melderon t-shirts and hoodies, head on over to Brand Young Media's Def Camp Melderon TV merchandise website. The link is in the description below.